Okay, great. All right, thank you. Uh, Marty's time is already going free. Marty's free. <laughs> If I start calling you by my daughter's name, then you know you'll know what's going on. Yep, gotcha. All right. Uh, thank you for your patience, everyone. I'd like to call this regular meeting of the Bethel Board of Selectmen to order for Tuesday, July 5th, 2022. Please rise and join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Thank you. Um, before we start with the agenda, I want to make a motion to add one item that got left off. Uh, it will be the last item on the agenda, which happens to be number 12. This is resolution uh, in support of sustainable Bethel. Uh, this is just a, uh, a resolution that we need to pass so that our sustainability commission is eligible for grant funding in the future um, and is recognized for the work they do by sustainable CT. So I'll make a motion that we add that as item number 12 on the agenda. Second. Is there a second? Second by Rich. Those in favor? Aye. 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 That carries. Uh, moving on to item number two, public comments. Anybody has anything to share? Uh, yes, sir. Again, Nick Ellis, 13 Fawn Road. Um, full disclosure, I am a board member of the Board of Finance, but I'm speaking for myself tonight. Um, we went the other night to a presentation about the high school. Uh, we were asked by Dr. Carver to go up, and it, it was a a really good presentation. There's a real need up there. But what I was really disappointed about was 50% of the issues were maintenance issues. And, and I understand the school was built in a certain time and it, it was designed uh, to just pull air out through exhaust fans, through open windows. But th during his, his presentation, he said there's 40 rooftop fans that are not working. And I had a conversation with him. He said either the breakers are off the belts are off or the engines are seized up. I'm sorry, the motors, electric motors are seized up. Now that's very disappointing as a lifelong resident that we have a million dollar building maintenance department, guys drive around in all these cars all day long and there's, there's maintenance issues. Bethel has a history of buying things and then not taking care of them. I came here deliberately for a few minutes early to this building. This is a, a, a shelter, this is a public building and I went around and I touched four exit emergency signs. There is no batteries in any of them. So shame on the Bethel, okay? They write tickets to the Bethel people, the businesses, if their exit signs don't work. I touch four of them and four of them don't work. You're going to leave a list of where they again, are. Again, this is, this is an input. And, and again, if someone wants, I'd be glad to walk around. It takes a simple test to do it. Okay. There's four that I touch and four don't work. Okay, but I'd be glad to talk about that offline. Well, and, if you can again, leave this, this is public input, not a debate. I appreciate it, but I'd be glad to show them. I'm, okay. I'm asking for your help on that. I'd Just leave, leave me the, the locations and I'll have the mates people. They're from over. here up to the ramp. And, and okay. whoever wants to do them, who's in charge of doing them, should do them. Okay. Okay. Years ago in the Hawley buildings in Danbury, we had completely dark hallways. I understand it's something that people don't look at all the time, but in public safety, someone should be in charge of that, especially with a town building. Mm -hmm. But again, we build a nice bridge down there by Wittesley, and the sand is still sitting on the sidewalks. You know, we have a history of not fixing it. We built a nice police department for over eight months. The cupola that we had to have, half of the light bulbs are out. They are finally fixed now, okay? But for six months, half of that cupola was shut down because the lights are out. You know what I mean? And then here we are ready to jump off a bridge and build a splash park, Okay. We're, we're, I believe on your agenda is to buy the, 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 the flood uh, lot right next to it. Mm -hmm. We're gonna spend whatever for the property, spend 200,000 for a parking lot in a flood zone. We should fix and invest this COVID money on stuff that we, that we own already. Stop, just keep building new stuff and let's fix what we have. I think the town would appreciate that more. Um, so again, I think I spoke enough. I don't normally come to a meeting and get upset about this, but when you say common stuff, it, it, this high school deserves to have this AC and we're thinking about spending a million of COVID money, we should put it right into the, our, our nice building that we have built and be proud of something we have instead of ham and egg everything. And that's all I have to say. Okay, thank you. And I'll be glad offline to, to, to walk you around. Okay. Cynthia McGorkendale, 19 Elgin Avenue. And then like Nick, I do come to these meetings when I'm upset, just to talk about how upset I am. We 
first of all, I do have a question about uh, why Marty is muted and still is. All the people are going to see on the video is Marty's face. Not a bad thing, but that's all they're going to see. They should probably just see the first. Switch the camera to the board of selectmen. <laughs> that's all. I mean, no offense, Marty. Just put it, put it on gallery. Yeah, there we go. So, um, yeah, I, I also attended that presentation for the Board of Ed for the uh, HVAC presentation. And although we did attend as invitees, as Board of Finance members, I'm also speaking for myself. I agree with Nick 100%. I've always had an issue with the idea of a splash park, especially at that level of money when everything was so um, fluid and moving and, and all the repercussions from COVID. And the two things that I, you know, I initially thought, you know, that could be redirected to school security. But then when I find out that there's a, a, a breach to be spanned in the amount of money for the HVAC that is available now due to other circumstances um, for special ed, I just don't see how we can invest in a, a splash park, which is going to involve, it's, it's going to change everything downtown with traffic, not only traffic and the parking lot, the whole thing, it just seems wrong to me. And um, when we have things that are actually related to COVID, things that are related, related to COVID that need to be remedied. So um, that's what I like to say. And as far as the maintenance, you know what really sticks in my mind is that, and I've been on the Board of Finance for a while, and I remember Wendy Smith used to always say, why can't we have nice things? We can't have nice things because they were nice once, and then they weren't nice anymore because they don't get kept up. And we get accused, and this has happened, that, you know, because we're stingy, like the Board of the Conservative Board of Finance members, and we don't want to spend anything and do it the right way. Well, we've done things the right way, and they're just let, you know, go to crap. So that's what I have to say. I think there has to be a real stepping up on, uh, on fixing the existing issues. And I believe that that, um, that park, that splash pad money should be redirected to the Board of Finance and if there's some for security for the schools. Thank you. Yeah. Hey, hey, Matt, before you go on, do yeah. I have the wrong agenda? I don't see anything on my agenda about some splash park. Oh, this no. no, this is Just Marty. This is public input. input. Yeah. No, I know that, but they they both alluded to. Well, I know Mr. Ellis did. He alluded to it was on the agenda about a splash park. I don't know anything about it. I'm sorry. We're, what was the what, Marty? Since you asked, what was the the extra building the lot, lot on your agenda for? The parking lot. Why are we buying buying a a, a, a if I can if I can oh, 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 I'm glad that if you guys don't mind. It's uh, not the issue. Yeah. It's not the issue, Marty? No, the issue is you said that there's a splash park and I'm looking on my agenda. All right, so Matt can explain why we're buy, buying a lot. So great, Matt, please. It's not special oh, fine. talk about anything we like. Okay, are the, before we get there, any other any other public comment? Um, Paula Antolini, you have your hand raised. If, if you have a comment, you can unmute. Yes, uh, Paula, yes Paula Antolini, Jacobs Lane. Um, I'm just going to make a general comment about three gigantic issues that loom over Bethel forever. Uh, it's, of course, you know all three, affordable housing and parking, the turf field, and what's happening in the school with SEL and things like that. I'm just going to tell you that every meeting I attend, I watch residents get up and say how you know disappointed they are in what's going on in Bethel and nothing happens to address their issues. And Bethel is moving forward in a direction that many residents do not like, but it doesn't matter because it seems that thing just, things just get approved. And I know you're going to say public meeting, have public hearings and all of that, but, uh, I don't believe they're publicized well, and one of them was not, even though you're disagreeing with me um, about uh, something about the turf field lease. But that aside, I would just like to speak with you at length at some point 
about all three of these issues and what's going on in the residents' minds. Maybe you don't see it, but uh, it, you know, Cindy Lane, people recently have been at a meeting arguing why this giant building shouldn't go on their block. I know it's A30G, but there have to be some parameters here that the P and Z can set. I, I even suggested it at their meeting and they like that, that perhaps they should have a guideline before any uh, applications get uh, submitted saying, you know, what the style of Bethel is regarding exteriors, that you like green space, because all of these things are discussed over and over at the PNZ meetings. But, but I just wanted to make the general comment about all three of these issues. I don't feel that they're over because public hearings close and things are voted upon. That's not how a town should run. You really need to know how the people are thinking. And that's all I'm gonna to say tonight on this, unless you want to speak about all three of these issues at length. Uh, Paul, if you'd like to contact me offline, um, I'll be glad to set up some time to talk to you. Keep in mind that everything you've talked about tonight is a planning and zoning issue, which the Board of Selectmen has zero authority over. So uh, you, 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 you're the person in charge of this town. Okay, well, I'm, not, yeah, I'm not gonna debate that point. Um, they have okay. control over that. Again, if you would like to make an appointment, we can talk by phone or by Zoom or in, in my office if you like. It's, uh, it's entirely up to you. I'll be glad to make time for you. Thank you. Thanks for your comment. And I, 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 uh, I appreciate that. And um, I'd, I'd like it on the record if possible. You, what do you mean on the record? I'd like to videotape it. Okay. You can make it a Paula, make an appointment and we can we're, we can I will answer your questions as best I can. It's not really all right. I, I'm not gonna prolong this, but it's not questions, it's it's issues that the town has right now that residents are not happy about. Okay, well, we can talk. Okay. Thank you for your comments. Anything else? Anybody else have anything? All right, uh, moving on to correspondence. I, I'm, I'm sorry, Mayor. You were just going to explain, Marty asked to explain what the-, the Yes, I'm, I'm going to get to that. I'm going to make that as part of the first selectman's report, which is coming up next. I just wanted to check, Mary, was there any correspondence that came in? No. Late breaking. Okay, so item number five, uh, first selectman's report. Number one, um, there is a splash park that the uh, Park and Rec uh, Commission has proposed. It's this is not a new con, and I'm just going to give you a status update. We're not going to debate it tonight. Mm -hmm. This goes back several years. It's part of the long, long-term uh, capital plan for all of the parks. It's it's one of many improvements that plan that the uh, Park and Rec Commission would like to do. It's not approved. There's a long way to go. So I appreciate your comments. It may happen, it may not happen. There's, there's, uh, there's, it's possible we would have to have a referendum on that. So the people will have their opportunity to speak. So I appreciate you coming to, to share your thoughts on that. Um, I want to address also your comment about the HVAC system. I sat through the same presentation and I have to respectfully disagree that you that's- a, out before Excuse halfway. me, excuse me. Uh, the, I have studied these issues for a long time and I've discussed them with Dr. Carver for a long time. These are not maintenance issues with the HVAC. They are long past their useful life and they should have been replaced in the high school renovation back in 2005 to 2007. That's the issue. So um, I, I don't want people listening to this or watching the recording to think that there is an imp there is a an implication being made that the town is falling down on its maintenance. The town has actually spent a ton of money keeping those old dogs working as long as possible. And there just is no more life left in them. They need to be replaced. They should have been replaced as part of that 2005 renovation. There's just, there's no other way to put it. So, uh, and that, uh, I'm, I'm very happy that we have an opportunity to address that because it's not only the fact that the units are old and beyond their useful life, they were improperly designed in the first place, as you saw in that presentation with, you know, un, uncooled areas next to cool areas, which just puts more burden on it, mixes humid, warm air with the cold air and stresses out the system. There were and, things and that were wrong. Debate, in the, 
his presentation when the air was just coming out, it was 91 degrees in March, I believe the date was. Those are maintenance issues. The dampener was not closing. Okay. Not, and again, not to get a debate. Well, we are getting into a debate, needs. and I have well, to disagree. There's lots of needs because equipment age, okay. but he said 50% of it was maintenance issues also. Uh, okay, I'm going to disagree with you. Okay, we can talk fine. about it offline. That's the, fine. The, when, whenever there, I, I just want to stay for the record so people understand. When there is a call to fix something, it gets fixed. And because I you make say sure it louder that. doesn't mean you're right. I was at the same meeting. And I'll debate any of that meeting. We can we have it on tape, and okay. we can both sit there and watch it, okay. and we can debate every issue that that Craig and, and, and uh, the other gentleman talked about. So because you're louder doesn't mean you're writer. I don't normally come in public meetings and speak, but I speak highly of this. Okay, so I'm, I appreciate you know your what? time and listening. Yeah, I appreciate you too, Absolutely. and I'm allowing you to debate this, and I shouldn't. So okay. I think we're just going to call it right there. All I'm, right, we we can meet offline. I don't have a problem with that. And right. I do appreciate. The respect and you listening to me. Okay. okay. Thank, Thank you. Me. Have a good night. Thank you very much. Take care, everyone. Come on, the home's going to close up. Oh, I got to get you in before the door locks. No, that's on. She's on a nursing home. That's not a nurse. That's not a All right, moving on, some other items in the first elections report. Um, tomorrow, the uh, uh, Housing Authority will honor Jane Hall. Many of you remember Jane, was the uh, executive director of the Bethel Housing Authority, uh, operated Rental Bridge for about 35 years. They, uh, the new renovated uh, community center is going to be named the Jane Hall Community Center in Reynolds Ridge. And I will be on hand to issue a proclamation and thank her for her 35 years of serv service to uh, the Housing Authority. Item number two under Selectman's report, um, as we've been talking uh, as part of our online permitting system, uh, file scanning has been going underway under, for the past two months. We are about halfway through having literally all of the documents in the building department and land use department scanned and will be fully online probably by sometime this fall. This will be a very, very huge efficiency gain and time saver for our staff. It will also make um, staff time digging through uh, FOI requests, a thing of the past. All of these documents will be at their fingertips. Later in the year, moving into the fall and winter, uh, we'll begin scanning all of the health records. So uh, by the end of the calendar year, we should have all of that stuff completely online. And last but not, and again, this is a, a technological change that is going to save staff time and overtime costs more than I can even calculate right now. It, it's going to be a tremendous thing. Number three, our sustainability commission has been, they've only had four meetings. They're already hard at work. Want to uh, just read off this uh, parts of this uh, uh, press release that we have on July 30th. The Energy Museum on Wheels is coming to Bethel. This is sponsored by the Energy Commission and the Sustainability Commission. This is a 50 foot uh, tractor trailer that uh, has all kinds of energy games inside of it for kids. Uh, such as a bicycle that will allow you to pedal and power light bulbs. So you can see how much energy it takes to light up a room or light up a city. Um, other types of energy demonstrations, they'll have a uh, ice cream truck on hand for the kids and games and prizes. And this is part of the Heat Smart program, which um, gives Bethel residents the opportunity to have a home energy evaluation. This is worth about uh, $200 in terms of the, 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 the staff time uh, and it's sponsored by Eversource. They will come into your home, energy experts will come into your home. They will do um, airflow testing, uh, test the uh, insulation, they'll test for air leaks. Um, it costs $50 per household to, and you, they will literally replace most of your light bulbs as part of that. So you, the average home gets somewhere between $150 and $200 worth of goods out of a $50 investment. And for every uh, home energy that we, we, this is co-sponsored co by the Bethel Chamber of Commerce. So every home energy eval uh, evaluation comes with a $25 gift card to a Bethel Chamber, to any Bethel Chamber, and uh, entry into a raffle that's also sponsored by the Chamber. So um, I'm 
very pleased with the amount of work that our sustainability commission is already doing. Um, so that's all I have. Uh, Rich and Brian, do you have anything to add to you add to any, or any questions? Okay, moving on. Item number five, consideration of special meeting minutes. That's uh, items uh, A1 through A6 in your packet. I'll entertain a motion to approve those minutes. So moved. Second. All right, any, uh, any changes, any comments? Hearing none, those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. All right, that carries. Uh, item number six, and I'm, I'm going to, uh, this is, uh, I'm gonna welcome Dr. Carver to talk about school security. Um, and I, I don't know if you if you and the chief want to do this together because he's item number seven on the, on the agenda. I'll go first. Then. You can go first. Yeah. Um, so I sent to you um, that presentation. Did yes. You, can you project it or not? Oh, well, let me, yeah, you know what? I, I didn't I, think we we're going to, let me bring that up. Well, Mr. Strayton asked me to come. Um, he, uh, it was wonderful that you could attend uh, the school security session that we did right after Uvalde. Uh, a bunch of parents asked me if I could present to them how we approach school security in the school. And I promise you, I'm not going to relive the whole presentation, um, but I just wanted to uh, highlight a few points. And Matt, while you're pulling it up, I'll, I'll just kind of yeah. plow through some of it, just to give you a broad overview of it. You know, obviously, school security is our top uh, priority in the schools. We want to make sure that both our students are staff, the staff are not only feel uh, physically safe in the building, but also emotionally safe uh, within the building. And, um, and so we approach it from two different perspectives. The physical security of the building, you know, how hardened it is if we did have an intruder within the building. Um, and then we also approach it from how do we develop a climate within the district to really develop social emotional health of our student so that none of our students feel, because if you look at the pattern of, and I'm sure the chief can speak to this much better than I can, if you look at the pattern of people that have, we've had uh, school shooter incidences, the profile of those individuals are, are uh, unfortunately quite commonly the same. Um, and, um, and so we've gone to a lot of trainings, uh, both, both with the police department and both offered through the FBI and other different types of organizations. I mean, I would say we, we have a fabulous relationship with the Battle Police and they've really been a partner as we've kind of gone through this process as we think about school security. Can I interrupt you for just a second? Yes. Uh, Mary, could you make me a co-host and I can project from here? And Matt, I'm gonna to have to flip through quickly because again, I'm not gonna repeat, I'm gonna have you flip through quickly. Okay. I'm not gonna repeat the whole presentation. Um, but, um, you know, the profile of the perpetrator, um, and I, Brian, I know, because you, you were in law enforcement for so many years, is pretty typical um, in terms of um, individuals that have been involved in school shooting situations. So we wanted to make sure, especially that evening, that our parents understood what are some look fors or what are some things that you should be looking for, whether with your own child or that your child might be experiencing to identify potential threats and perpetrate, uh, perpetrators of any type of school yeah. violence. Um, hey, Mary. Um, go to participants. Um, just click on. Am I? Oh, I see over on the right hand side. See where my name is. Yeah. Uh, three dots. Yeah. And you and make, make co-host. Co oh, thank you. Then you can show it. There we go. Thank you. Sorry. So um, identifying the warning signs um, of potential perpetrators and threat that might be made to the school is an important, really, really important part of our work. So if you flip forward, uh, Matt, unfortunately, Steve wasn't available that night, so Jason and I did the presentation together, and he was just fabulous. Um, because the reality is, FBI statistics have been pretty clear that um, you know, 93% of all incidences um, that they're, that they're the warning signs that have been eligible. So if you flip forward, Matt. Yes. So 93% um, of the, in, the perpetrators that exhibited concerning behavior were, were stereotypical of, of um, people that have been involved in any type of um, school violence incidences. 
But more important, 81% of those instances were known to somebody prior to the incident occurring. So what we really try to advocate to our students and our parents is if you see something, I mean, it's the Sandy Hook Promise motto, but if you see something, say something. Um, you know, nothing is too minor that we don't want to know about so that we can uh, investigate that threat because behavior is the largest predictor of school violence. Um, and so that's not that's something that we work with our parents on and with our students on really reinforcing that concept. If you know something, if you, something doesn't feel right to you, make sure that you're communicating that to the appropriate uh, person. And what what happened, Matt, can you go to the next slide? Mm -hmm. What happened in um, after Sandy Hook is that um, I know Steve and Brian know this, but uh, Public Act 13 uh, three passed and it required all school, school districts in the state of Connecticut to have a common format on how to develop, um, um, it's called our All Hazard Safety and Security Plan. And it's based on the FEMA model of incident response. Um, and with doing that, doing that plan and adopting that plan across the state of Connecticut, it gave us common protocols and it gave us a common language to not only talk to the police, but also work with EMS staff that respond to a scene. And so we have had that in place. I think we had to institute the first year I was in Bethel, so that was 2014, that we initially developed that plan. And we've had since that time a district safety and security team. And who sits on that is um, certainly central office staff, our building principals, but we also have teachers. Tommy Gallagher sits on it to represent the town and EMS. Our SROs come um, and participate on it. And our whole job as a district safety and security team is to develop the best practices that we can and to revise our um, all hazard safety and security plan. We meet as a district team three times a year, three to four, I would say. And um, the schools also have teams. And at, um, at that level, their team is, um, meets um, to, um, to run drills, um, to talk about safety protocols in the building, all of those pieces. And, um, and we also, I'm sorry, we also have parents on that committee. And so this is a broad overview of what that committee covers. Um, and one of the things, the second to the last on the bottom is we do annual security audits. So the Department of Homeland Security actually gives a protocol to the schools of, it's, it's, it's almost like a checklist. I know you've seen it, Steve. Um, it's almost like a checklist of different aspects of school security that involves physical security, mental health services that we provide students, um, how do we um, process threats and crisis interventions. And so every spring we take this assessment and we use this assessment to, to improve our practices and plan kind of for the coming year. Um, and so the way we do it is each SRO meets with our school principal and actually the um, head of maintenance in the building or the head custodian in the building. And they go through the whole protocol. They come to the safety and security meeting and we talk about it as a district, each school does. Um, and then they make recommendations uh, to us for budgetary, uh, uh, either, either it's um, uh, practices and protocols that need to be revised or changed, or we actually add it to part of our security plan as a district and then look towards funding sources to make that happen. Um, so that's a big part of our work um, as we do. I'm, I'm going fast, so if you have questions, just stop me. Okay. Okay. Um, if you go, Matt, to the next page. Um, you know, these are just some terms that we use in the district, and I try to publicize this to parents um, so that they know, um, because what oftentimes happens, and we try to put out messages immediately. Uh, we recently had an incident. Lockout. We had a lockout um, at the end of the school year. Unfortunately, it was the same week as Evaldi, um, where we had to do a lockout. And so we, we want to make sure our parents and our students understand those terms so that if we go into them, how we're going to communicate, what they mean, first of all, how we're going to communicate it to them, um, and um, and any follow up that might occur as a result of that. So we want to make sure that we include that as part of our process. Next slide. Um, we also do tabletops and drills. Um, you know, we do lockdown drills. We do, um, and we try to we 
when we were in COVID, we were not allowed to do lockdown drills as we typically would have done lockdown drills because of the close proximity of students to each other. Um, but we have resumed that process. And, um, and so we, we do, we do, um, we do drill, we do three to four times a year we drill uh, with our students and we try to drill in, in situations where it wouldn't be common. So an example might be, we'll drill during a lunch wave. Um, we'll do a lockdown drill during a lunch wave so we can practice, well, if this actually happened now, what would you do and how would you react to that, for that, that set of circumstance? Um, and uh, and that, that has definitely helped. We've also done a lot of tabletops where we brought in a situation and like I said, the police, EMS, we all participated in them. And, um, you know, a few years ago, pre-COVID, um, we did one on a chemical spill that we had to evacuate the campus. And, um, and what, what I find is helpful is we run through our protocols and we go through it as if we're actually happening. But at the same time, we realize what we don't know. Like in that particular instance, we actually didn't know how many buses we would need to evacuate, you know, within a certain period of time. Like how many buses would have to pull up at Barry School, mm -hmm. pick up every kid and the staff member in that building and haul out. Um, um, so those are the kinds of things that we, we regularly engage with. I, I would say during the last couple of years with COVID, it hasn't been as regular, um, but last spring we did our first tabletop again. The whole idea here is that we're constantly um, going through different types of situations and strategies. Um, and then we do after action reports where we, where we look at how we reacted in that particular circumstance and what do we need to learn and do differently um, as a result of that. Um, so those are those are a regular part of our process. And um, I would also add that the um, that the um, the police have been wonderful. They have done active shooter training with our with our staff twice. Um, unfortunately, this again, it was the same week as Uvalde. The second time we did it, it happened to be, we had scheduled it, for six, it, like it we had scheduled it for six or eight months, and it happened to be the Friday after Uvalde. Oh, my goodness. So we, I sent an email to the staff and said, look, you know we were having this training on Friday. <coughs> um, if you don't feel comfortable going because it's just too raw at this time, please know we're going to tape it. If you want to watch it another time, um, that's okay. Um, but you have the option to come. I would say 98% of the staff came. Mm -hmm. And I want to commend both um, um, Lieutenant Liberty, I just call it on, Sergeant May. Sorry. They really did an excellent job, um, you know, not only training our staff, but making sure that they feel reassured. That the, how the Bethel Police Department would have responded in that circumstance. So it, it actually, I think, um, not that you all think it was in any way good, but I think that um, that they really um, helped, um, you know, alleviate some stress that they might have had just coming off that experience and and knowing how the response level would be. So that was very very good. So this is just about physical security, and I'm not going to talk about each one of these, but the whole idea with physical security is you hire them. Your core. So people can't get in, whether that's practices or protocols. And we have been working over the past several years to make sure that all of the features that were designed for Rockwell and Johnson have extended to Bethel Middle School, Bethel High School, and Ferry School. I think I've shared with you that we got two Department of Homeland Security grants in the, at, the, at the end of the school year. And the capital plan that we presented to you and the Board of Finance on school security, it was in 2019 or 18, <laughs> um, but it was a while ago. Most of almost all of those items are now going to be taken care of through that grant, um, both of those grants. One of them is specifically geared to Bethel Middle School. Um, it'll replace the camera systems, it will replace the ballistic film on glass. It, it has a lot of um, uh, the paging system was another uh, another piece to it that was that will all be replaced in this in this new with this new grant money. Um, and then we we didn't think we were going to get Buffalo High School, but then when we got the second, which is called the multimodal inter is that multimedia multimedia operational. So that what that grant was is to increase the connection from the schools to the PD. 
So right now, the PD has access to all of our camera systems. They have access to, they monitor our district channel. So we have one of our walkie talkies there. Um, so when we're in an emergency situation, we all switch to district channel. Mm -hmm. um, so they had already monitored, the, they have already had the capability to monitor the district channel and a lot of other features. And we actually have um, the police channel on our walkie talkie systems too, if we, if we needed it. I don't think we could use it, but if we needed it. So um, this, these two grants, and Jen is working right now on setting up all the vendors and making sure all the systems are operated, really will take us really far in meeting all of the, the school security things that we had wanted over the couple of years, past couple of years. There are a few things that weren't funded um, in, in the grant, but for the most part, um, I think it was a $600,000 capital plan we put forward. Um, most of that is going to be taken care of um, through the security grant, and that's 50 cents on a dollar. So um, we're using the unexpended funds account to pay the balance of the 47%. 46% 46 that uh, is our responsibility to be able to kind of bring everything up to speed. So we, we really have made a lot of improvements over the past several years. And I think going into next year, um, we'll be in really good shape once we get the, the high school camera replaced and all of these other features added into it. So um, you know that we drill with students. Uh, we have been doing the canine locking drills. I just wanted to if you fast forward a little bit. This is the, the framework that we train with, with the police. It's called Run, Fight, Hide, Fight. And it's really about developing situational awareness in different situations. There used to be very prescriptive ways that you would, um, um, we were trained if, if there was a school shooter coming into a building. You lock your doors, you go into a corner. Um, and those are all still important in some situation. That's what we call hide. But we also train both our staff and our students in run and fight also. Um, so meaning, if we've gotten okay with the police, um, I'm just making this up for a conversation. So say there's an incident um, in the gym at the high school, but, and the police know it's isolated to the gym, they might want us to evacuate out on a certain part of the building. Uh, and that's what they call run. <laughs> so they get out of the danger and, and fight. And the whole idea is, um, we practice drilling so people unfortunately get better at it. And then if the situation were to occur, um, they, would have, they would have a better uh, reaction to it. The police also train in our buildings. Um, so they come in and they do um, shooter training yeah. in the building um, and have done, done it for years. Yeah. Done it for years. Um, but we also want to make sure that we don't panic in a crisis and we want to be able to, um, with both our staff and our students, think through on how to re react to that. And then lastly, quick forward to, to where it says six, you can keep going. Um, this is how we um, keep going. Yeah, keep going. This is um, the other thing is that just and I'll end here. You really also want to make sure, if you look at the profile of a lot of these um, uh, individuals that have been involved, one of the things that has come up very frequently is that they were bullied at school and they had access to weapons. So there are two kind of combination of factors. And so we really want to also make sure that our students are feeling psychologically um, comfortable at school. So the next series of slides that I won't go through right now are really on the, on the climate and psychological side, the different ways that we offer emotional support to our students if they are experiencing difficulties in school. We're not perfect. There are situations where bullying does occur. And I would even say that bullying is much worse post-COVID than it was before. I think a lot of it starts online. Um, and, um, and that um, because for years and years and years, kids were, um, their primary social interactions were through technology. Because we were all, um, you know, uh, trying to keep everybody healthy. Um, I think the net effect of that is, is that now that's how kids are interacting almost all the time. And what's happening is, I think we're all, even as adults, we're aware people are much more, not, they're not as nice 
online as they are in person, right? When you actually talk to them. And so we're seeing increased behavioral concerns as a result of that. So part of our job is to partner with parents, staff, and students so that we can all work with each other to try to develop a climate where kids feel psychologically safe in school. And there's a lot of different ways that we do that. And if you, if you go through the slide, it's at some point, you can see different examples of how that occurs in school. Um, but we feel like that's just as important as the mental health side is just as important as the, the physical security that we, we wanna offer our students. Um, so I'm happy to answer any questions. I know I went through that really quickly. <laughs> yeah, who is, who's in charge? At, in the beginning, is it the principal in charge until, or is the RSO officer in charge when if he's in the in building? In an shooter situation? Yes. Yeah. It would be the police. Okay. It would be 100% of the police. And so we use the incident current command structure and when, whenever the incident is occurring, they would be in charge of the scene. Um, and, and probably after that, if there, were, if there were any type of injuries or casualties, it would be the EMS fire people, and then it would turn over to us. But they also have something called a unified command. A unified command, and that means that we work together. So, um, but in that situation, it would be the police. I don't see yeah. No, they were. <laughs> now would depend on who's there for it. Like the SRO originally, but then obviously Sergeant shows up and then the lieutenant shows up to take it. Right. You said the grant was for 600,000? No, no, no. The original capital plan was for 600,000. Do you have those? Yeah. yeah. Um, Jen will pull up the spreadsheet and um, we'll tell you the total amount and then we'll tell you what our share of it is. And that's what you said you were using the unexpended account? Right, right. So the unexpended funds account was, was set up to use for opportunities right. and emergencies. And this is a great opportunity. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Got it? Okay. Um, we'll get it. So, yeah, this is the reason I'm asking that. I'm curious to see what the balance is. and. You know, right, right, but that has to be added up, right? So, our portion of it, yeah, um, it's about four or five hundred thousand. She's going to add it up. And what's the total you have of the unexpended? Right now, yeah, yeah, we have about seven hundred thousand now, but remember, we have we have to, um, a hundred thousand of that was gone because right. of the maintenance. Oh, from the budget for last year. So it'll strip out about 250000 right? In that internal funds. So the total of the grant is what? The total of the grant, um, the Go part ahead. we awarded, or the total of all the, the work? The total of all the work is 439. Yeah, 439, 179. And you're responsible for 200? Yes, we're responsible for, um, she'll get that for you, but yeah, 201000 So I guess my question is, is did you, like consider approaching the Selectman to see if some ARPA well, funds could kind of supplement it? I, I didn't consider like where the fund source came from. Mm -hmm. So to be fair, I mean, that, that's your decision, you know, in terms of, but we did consider, and, you know, we talked about the HVAC issues, which I'm going to agree with Matt um, with his comments. I just want to say that on the record too, <laughs> um, that, that, We've got this kind of crazy issue going on right now. We the have any, what's that? With the HVAC. We have that, and Brian, we have a huge number of, a huge increase in special education needs in our district. Um, part of it is for kids moving in to the district. And part of it is um, the fact that um, we have 24 students out of district place now. When I started, we had 17. You gotta remember, one out of district placement is over $100,000 typically. The problem that we ran into this year, and we've been using our ESSER funds to be able to address it, and I shared it with Matt, and I shared it with Cynthia and Nick too. We had to add six paraeducators in our special ed grant. We had to add another four, four in, our, um, in the ESSER grant. So we're taking that money out of HVAC to be able to pay for those. But it's only the grant's only good for another two years. When that when that that money goes away, assuming that the, we have the same students and they have the same needs, it's going to be a huge hit um, to the town. So we're trying to mitigate it 
Um, so to cut to the chase, you have other plans possibly for the ARPA funds. We we definitely do. Right. And, <laughs> and and the unexpected funds account, if the selectmen yeah. wanted to consider using the balance in any way to help mitigate that, however you decide to do it, that two hundred two hundred thousand dollars, it would certainly help if we run into special ed issues or continue to fund up down to special ed issues in the next couple of years. I know that was a convoluted answer. No, I, I, I mean, you know, personally, to me, it would make sense to possibly split it with them with some ARPA funds to help them out just because that unexpended funds account is so important. I mean, I For remember the reasons. Yeah. Well, I remember the chillers when the chillers right? went. So, <laughs> yeah, I mean, if we have the ARPA funds, I mean, I personally think it would make sense, especially going towards school security, mm -hmm. you know, that's a great use of use of those funds. I mean, I would say. Well, anyway. this is a perfect time to segue into <laughs> the chief's discussion. So, um, first and foremost, we're very lucky. We do have a great relationship with the schools, and I feel we do a great job with our SRO program and working with the schools. And we're in a unique situation where all our schools are together, so we're able to cover more ground with less personnel, so to speak. Um, but that being said, um, this year after the Texas shooting, um, the week after, I put in an additional police officer at the schools every day. So there was the two SROs and then a third officer that just went around campus, basically. And they were in and out of the schools, too, but basically more of a perimeter security type person. And uh, we did it for a week, and uh, everybody thought it was a great idea. And during that week, I got all kinds of calls from Matt and probably at least 20 other citizens, what are we doing to increase school security right now? So after discussing with the police commission, my command staff and, and Matt, we decided to uh, put that extra officer there for the rest of the school year. Some days it was just pulling someone from patrol, but when patrol was already down a minimum, we were paying overtime to put somebody there. So we did that to the end of the school year. So in the meantime, it was, what do we do moving forward to increase our school security? So one suggestion that was brought to me was hire armed security, an armed security person. You mean so like, like uh, not a licensed we, officer, but a yeah, security, yeah, private security. Private, you know, but yeah. they would work for the town or whatever, but they would be just armed security. They wouldn't be a police officer. Um, I don't like that idea. Um, I don't think they have the training or the police powers that if someone randomly walked onto the school complex, they have no authority to put them in handcuffs or arrest them or cite them on a violation or trust, you know, set those simple trespass or whatever it may be. Um, so then someone suggested to me, I'm like, well, why don't you just make it as an overtime shift every day? And we could hire overtime every day. So I went to sound the calculator and um, it would be approximately $86,000 for the year to hire someone on overtime every day to be there as that third person. So um, again, I ran it through my command staff, and um, I thought the best idea was to hire an additional police officer. And I know we just got to in the previous budget that we're in, um, but without taking from our current staff to have an additional police officer would be would be the answer to increase security. Um, for eighty six thousand dollars, will cost an overtime to hire an additional person. Well, approximate here with benefits and everything else is about a hundred thousand dollars. So eighty six thousand, hundred thousand to get a full another full time employee. Um, for that little bit of difference, I think the full time employee is the, the route to go. Um, and we do have that person a little bit in the summertime, although it's not much because that's usually when they take their vacation and other time off. But we would have that additional person here and there, and they could work shifts when the school's not in session or. There's a snow day that we work patrol. So it does help the police department overall. Not greatly, but it would help. Mm -hmm. um, so that's where we're at as far as I brought that idea to the police commission um, and Dr. Carver, and they're both 120% on board with it. I think it's a good idea. So I'm presenting that idea to you guys and see what you guys think. And if you guys think it's a good idea, move forward and obviously the money is the situation, so I'm assuming we'd have to go to the Board of Finance next. That's up to you guys. Well, um, well, to Brian's point, it could be 
uh, in theory, because I don't, I, I don't know where we stand with all the ARPA funds. I'm pretty sure that there's still big areas that uh, are yet to consider. It could be considered uh, as a temporary funding for ARPA, but then would have to be folded into the budget uh, later. But it, it's certainly something that I would be willing to consider. And I think we have to, I think we have to have a formal proposal. Just you know, send us a memo on that so I can put that, give that to the comptroller so we can crunch the numbers. And uh, and we'll consider it. Did you were you were you thinking you wanted to vote on that tonight? Or I mean, it's up to you guys. I mean, but um, I'll back up one thing. In 2012, after was it 2012 after Sandy Hook? Yeah. Um, it was proposed by the Chief Finch and the Police Commission back then that we have three SROs in the school. Okay. And that got cut down to one by the Board of Finance back then. So just so you know, it's not an old idea either. It okay. was what we had proposed back. Ten so, years ago now. So you're proposing this as, as a permanent SRO. Correct. Correct. For Correct. and I would like to do it in time for this fall. Is what I would really would like to have that extra person there so we could do it right at the beginning of the school year. And I know it would be kind of hard to hire someone in that time, but we would pull someone temporarily to fill that position and then when we had the opportunity to hire and train the, the next person. Okay. Would you be looking for a uh, Officer already in the, in the SRO I, business, I, or or would you start with a new trainee? It depends on what's out there. We out, we constantly when we advertise, we're actually in the middle of a hiring process right now. We advertise for entry level and certified. Sometimes we find certifieds. Um, we just actually hired the guy that um, was in North Carolina that um, has moved back up here, and we just hired him this morning last week as an example. Uh, but the one before him was entry level, so. We, go through the process and sometimes we get lucky and find qualified certifies and sometimes we don't and find qualified entry levels and it just takes a little bit longer unfortunately to get them up and run. Is that is the entry level less than, than the hundred thousand? No originally or is that just it's just an estimate basically. Yeah. Um, I think starting pay right now is about sixty thousand dollars for entry level. You're, you're not gonna put a year one cop in there. You're talking about training someone to be a third SRO, oh, yeah. a real SRO. Yeah. So would they would like split the elementary schools or something? So you could do it a couple different ways, but my thought is is we have the primary in the high school that covers Barry currently. The second SRO is in the middle school that covers the other two schools down below. We could do it some other ways, but my original thought is to have the third one kind of more of an outside security, but also there every day so they're part of the school and people know who they are and if the SRO is out. I haven't told you, but I've been thinking about it too. Yeah. I think Johnson, Johnson is just as big as the middle school. So almost 700 students at Johnson. Really? So you we know, could make that their home base too. Their home base. I agree with you. They should probably rotate around, but when you think about that and you think about, um, unfortunately, this, the, the things that we're seeing at that level um, is much different than yeah. even five or six years ago. So I think that the presence might not be that. I would want to see a lot of, more time at Johnson than the other schools. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We could kind of figure all that out later, but, but you're, gonna send them, you're gonna send them to the SRO school. Oh, absolutely, yes. yeah. yeah. Yeah, all of them go. And um, one thing I'll say, Brian, in the little bit of time that we had that kind of position this last spring here towards the end of the year, the things they picked up on that probably you don't even know is just like little suspicious things on the outside that the SROs normally want to pick up on because they're inside the schools interacting with the kids. Um, you know, obviously it all turned out mostly to be nothing, but still they're out there noticing these things a lot better because they're out there looking for them. Now, so, if if one of your SROs calls out sick mm -hmm. or is on vacation, do you backfill it with an officer from patrol? No, but we if they're both out, we will pull some off patrol and at the schools for the day. So we'll never go less than one SR. Currently, my idea is if we get this third position, it's never go less than two. And even when they've gone down to one, like he'll have um, Dirk and he'll have different people come through. You can yeah. see how they belong yeah, we'll, when they're down. We'll put, yeah, we'll usually get somebody up and around the schools. Right. So. And you guys are going to present this tomorrow night to the Board of Finance? No, no, that I know of. no that's, a, that's a special meeting. That, that, that agenda is already set. Yeah. Um, I'm just going through the progression here is, you know, was asked of what I thought was the best idea, yeah. and this is what I think the best idea is. Yeah. 
time do you want to wait for that information? Well, I, I, I think I, I'm in support of this. Uh, I, I think before we vote, we have to uh, crunch the numbers and, and have a recommendation from the town controller as to how we're going to fold that into the current budget. Um, and I mean, at the worst, it's going to be two weeks. Well, uh, we, our next regular meeting is July 19th. Yeah. I based the overtime numbers on top patrolman's overtime rate, yeah, which right. 80 percent of the guys are at top step now. So right. that's a pretty accurate number. And sometimes a sergeant could work those jobs too. So sometimes it could be a little bit more, could be a little bit less if a brand new yeah. rookie officer worked the overtime. I think the issue is, I mean, if it's an SRO, it's an SRO. Yeah. Well, if we're just looking for security, I would tell you to use overtime. That would be my personal opinion. Because if this person is going to be an SRO, they're going to be I'd in rather, school, they're going to be teaching. Right. Fine. I understand that. But if it's just security, driving from school to school, I mean, then I would just say well, let's do it with overtime. Myself. I think it's a big difference, Brian, with if you did it as overtime, and you know, just yeah. as well as I know, that you're going to have different guys. Some guys are, are just going to be there for the money, and some guys are going to be. We want someone yeah, that's there on a regular basis that's going to be part of the school. Right. And again, I'm not saying to do your job, but for my support, I would just want to know that they're going to be an SRO. Yes. They're going to be teaching in the school. They're yeah. actually going to be interacting yeah. with the kids. Because if not, and you just, just know, throw the we only, cop in there. You know what I mean? certain personalities that need to be there. I get it. Yeah. If you wanted to consider any other piece of <laughs> <laughs> yeah. the the grant. Because um, we do have, Jen and I sat down today, the stuff that wasn't funded in the grant. Yeah. That worked out to be what, like 195? There were some can, things that- Can you tell us what it is? Like what yeah. what specifically- So in the grant? That, that's not funded, that you so felt you, you wanted. We, and to be, yes, I, I can. And um, a few years ago, in 2019, we had, I think I shared this, a security assessment um, done by um, the same guy who designed security for Rockwell and Johnson School. They are things like um, Ballard's, I, I, I don't know if that, is it? I have a list. Yeah. yeah. Um, so the thing, there were a grant proposal that we put in through for the high school, the middle school, and the dairy school. And only the middle school was the that included uh, Lucic film, the windows. Right. Um, Mad rocks for some of the doors so they could be shut. Um, some panic alarms, ballers out front. Like I call them target balls, yeah. you know, like the balls that yeah. you can't just arrive in. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, the S2 security system. We did We did take care of the S2. This oh, year. Yes, yes, we did. Uh, switches, support system, uh, uh, PA system upgrades. Yeah, so the PA system, and I'll tell you why. The PA system at both Barry and the high school are beyond their lifespan. Mm -hmm. And at times they can't, it's difficult to hear. So if you call a lockdown, because, and we, we tried to see if we could just through maintenance, um, get them recalibrated so that they work. But if you call a lockdown, um, depending upon where you might be, um, you may not hear it as clearly, including areas that are very loud by nature, like the band room, the gym, you know, you want your PA system to be loud. You want to make sure that you have strobe lights that are indicating that there's an announcement going off. So if there's a loud environment that you have that ability. So those are those are examples of the PA system. So it includes beacons though. Like you do have an audible alarm when you want to lock down at the kids or even right, right, right. recognize right. in case they can't hear. If you go to Johnson and Rockwell and yeah. if you go in, if you press the lockdown button. Um, cool. It comes up on the screen in all the classrooms, uh, not all the classrooms, but in certain areas, like the principal's office and things like that. It'll say an automated voice or a lockdown. Uh, so there are different um, different um, software programs that make all that happen. Um, and uh, one of the things that we did get through this grant is that we we um, are because time is always important, right? If it's an active shooter. So in the new grant, um, we're installing um, software at the PD that we can actually, um, uh, it bypasses the alarm system. So it, the signal goes right to the PD um, if there is any type of emergency. Um, and then there's a, there's a lot of other features, but what else, do I miss anything that we're not getting? It's approximately Yeah, it's about 110,000. I mean, personally, I think if we could spend 120,000 on a parking study, then this, we're talking about the most important commodity our town has is our youth. I mean, I, I'm, I would be in full support of using the ARPA funds to cover 
know the items that weren't covered by the grant 100%. Well, yeah, I was going to say we could we could make we could vote tonight to fund it for the first year out of our and then you know for hers maybe the second one-time purchase right mine is a one-time purchase hers is one-time purchase oh okay oh, for her other things yeah, yeah. under ten thousand that's oh, okay. short for yeah. I mean ballistic film I mean that'd be great I don't know how many schools have, I mean how many schools really have, have, have it in the state have them now <laughs> we have ballistic film but it'll be more it would be it would be replaced because I think it has a life a shelf life. Yeah. Yeah, so it, it deteriorates you have to replace it. So, and we told parents this at the session, you know, we do have them on the lower windows. Okay. Um, but it would, so in some cases, it would be a replacement of it. Well, the PA systems, I mean, that's a definite. I mean, yeah, the PA systems are really critical. I, I'm just saying, I'd be in 100% support using the ARPA funds for these, these projects to include the SRO. I mean, if you want, sense. I could write it all up for you, Matt, and send it to you. So that you could see, we could have Jen write up um, what yeah. what what's being funded in the grant, how much that's going to cost, what our share is, yeah. and then what's yeah. not, yeah. yes, and what the balance is. But she told you roughly. Okay. I will say too, a lot of the quotes that came at out when we when we originally wrote the grant, just like everything else in life, the quotes are coming up much higher. Um, <laughs> Than we had originally um, surprise right we had yeah. originally budgeted for it yeah. um, and so that's that's part of the problem too yeah are all your ARCA funds that yeah, on the school site or they're the case all, all spent they're all gone all spent um, the biggest the biggest piece of it was and it's all on our website so you can look line by line and it tells you exactly how it's spent um, but um, the biggest chunk of it was supposed to be for the HVAC. Um, but because we had to fund paraeducators and we wanted to make sure that we didn't um, have, we wanted to fund them for two years so that we didn't have a big problem after the end of this year um, or even then next year. Um, so we had to take $300,000 from HVAC and divert it to, to, to pay for the additional paraeducators because that was not part of our budget when we presented to the Board of Finance initially. So we're, we're making that up. So, well, that's, looking, that's, looking, that's a whole nother problem that we're coming to you <laughs> next meeting. <laughs> right. It has to do with the HVAC systems and um, um, kind of our next steps there. Okay. Uh, if you if you could write up that right. and total it, and Chief, if you could write up the proposal for the SRO, uh, I think we should vote on that at the next meeting. Okay. I, I have two more questions. Sure, go, yeah, go ahead. Sorry. Um, you know, the, the thing in Texas there with the keys, right? Do our police officers have the bobs? So, or do are all the doors bobbed now in the in the schools? So each um each police officer, although sometimes it doesn't work, I know that. <laughs> I know that. Each police officer either has a fob or they've been issued an ID. Either one works to okay. swipe into the building. Um. Each patrol car has one in their go box, which I don't even know where that is, but in their go box, they have a complete set of keys for, for the whole building. Okay. okay. So, yes. All right. um, I, I want to make a comment on that. Um, some time ago, Mr. Germanaro had set up a system where some of the building maintainers had those fobs too, so they could more easily access the buildings to, you know, to perform routine maintenance. We've canceled that. And they right. must check in through the yeah, office now. We need to know who's in the building. Yes. Yeah. You need to know when they come in and when they leave. They cannot enter the building the, the, using the key fobs anymore. Uh, my other question was the exterior doors, they're all alarm now? They are. And um, so there are some doors um, that, uh, so the, the alarm will go off if the door is opened, it'll set off the alarm panel. In the high school, we went a step further because I don't, you, I'm sure you've seen it when you've been there, but on each, almost all the doors, there's those red alarms that, um, that actually don't hook up to anything. It just alerts somebody nearby that the door has been opened because we found that the, um, that the kids were actually letting kids in. Yeah. <laughs> um, so yes, the answer is yes. And because we've um, added key, um, key fobs. I don't know. Is that what they're called? Mm -hmm. Yeah, because we've added key fobs to the exterior doors. When I first started, where you saw propping open of doors was like recess. Like teacher goes out to recess, they stick something in the lock in the door, 
so that um, so that they can come back in and they don't have to go all the way around. We made sure that they all have key fobs now so that that they don't. We really don't have an issue with propping open the doors. Can I say it never happens? Of course I can't. But because of those and because of the fact that each staff member has it, um, it it's it's been pretty good. The, also, the SROs are in the habit of checking them. I was just going to say that they do, when they do come across them, they make sure everybody has. <laughs> yeah. So we're constantly checking and, doors and making sure they're not. You know, I, I know most of the uh, schools have the man cave entrances. They, you know, they all know. Do now. Uh, how about what I haven't been in the high school entrance lately. Does that do. currently have one now? Yeah, we added one. So okay. it's a little awkward, but you know, when you go into the main entrance and there's um, um, there's two sets of double doors. Mm -hmm. So you have to you have to buzz in or swipe in. You get into the first entrance, just like at the elementary and the middle school. You then have to use the Raptor system to use your ID. So first you have to show your ID to get in the building. Why are you here? Then you have to go in and you have to run it through the visitor management system or the Raptor system. And they're locked in that space. So, um, and the way we designed it is that, um, that there's a dividing wall now in the, um, in the main entrance. So there's an exit and there's an entrance and they just stay locked. Okay. So you have to, you have to get double clicked to even get in. The, the, the. And, and you had mentioned about the, the chemical uh, evacuation of the campus. Yes. How long would it take to get all the buses? Well, um, so we have MOUs. We have MOUs uh, with um, different organizations, and I can't go into the detail about them yeah. because it's yeah. because it's security. It's but it's actually not it's not um, as bad as you might think okay. in terms of getting buses. What I was curious about would you, would you evacuate the children down? By the old police station or, or well, something like that. Here's how I would respond. It, it, it's, we have we have designated, but I can't share them in public session. We have designated areas that are used that are for reunification, and so we have MOUs to that effect. So we have different places in different places, depending upon how far we have to go. So say it's a chemical school that's isolated to a certain area. Well, Going to the old police station might be okay, yeah. but it might not. So it's that whole concept of situational awareness, right? And um, but we do have different plans if something should happen. Thank you very much. I appreciate you coming. And I tell you the truth, I was surprised there were many more parents at your conference. The presentation. presentation. That's actually a pretty good showing. <laughs> well, I would have liked to see the auditorium fill. I know. Um, but, it, especially right after the text. Right. Okay. And I did make the videotape available online like the next day. And so people got access to the information. I shared the PowerPoint. Um, and, and then other people just reached out. So, well, thank you very much for doing yeah. that. And thank you for coming tonight. Oh, absolutely. Okay, so you're going to send me yep. the, the list of items, and uh, if you can just send a memo, you know, with the, the cost of the SRO, the, the basic cost, you know, benefits, all that, we'll plug it in. Benefits, I, I just guessed the name, but I'm sure Brad well, has. Yeah, Brad, exactly. Brad can help you with that. Yeah. So we'll, we'll, we'll formalize the numbers, and uh, I, I can tell you right now, I, I will support it. I think my, yeah. my colleagues are pretty strongly predisposed to improving school safety as well, so. That's uh, the proverbial no-brainer, as, as they say. All right, thank you very much for coming tonight. Appreciate it. And congratulations again on your new position. Thank you. You're the new Terry. Yeah. Uh, exactly. After a few months, we'll stop calling you the new Terry. And, uh, use your real name. <laughs> You'll have to suffer with it for a little while. Sorry, I know you All right, thank you. I think the closing speaker, someone else uh, yes, yes. Uh, yes. Uh, yeah, a couple more things that we're going to talk about the firing range. Uh, item number eight, consideration of uh, the purchase of offer, making an offer to purchase 134 South Street, parcel number 15-22-02. Um, before I, let me, let me just read into the record you, uh, but I, I, I want people watching this video to, to hear this because of the previous conversation during uh, public input. Uh, dear members of the Board of Selectmen, this is a memo from the Bethel Parks and Recreation Commission dated June 29th, 2022. 
Dear members of the Board of Selectmen, at a special meeting of the Park and Recreation Commission on June 29th, 2022, the Commission considered and unanimously voted to strongly recommend that the Town of Bethel purchase the vacant lot for sale at the address 134 South Street. This lot is fortuitously located directly across the street from the often inadequate existing parking lot at Carloa Park. The need for more parking has been known for many years and was recently highlighted at the Commission's regular meeting on June 22nd, 2022, where possible improvements to the park were presented to the public. Over a dozen members of the public, including many residents who live near Parloa, expressed a current need for additional parking. This need will only become more acute if enhancements to Parloa are made in the future. Therefore, the Commission recommends that the town seize this, opportunity, this unique opportunity by purchasing and developing this property as additional parking for Parloa Park. The reason I wanted to read that is that it, this has nothing directly to do with the, the proposed and possible improvements to the park. It's uh, parking at Parloa on Saturdays and Sundays and days when there's uh, a lot of youth soccer games is already an issue. So this is an opportunity. Uh, you'll see in the packet, I've included the field card. This piece of property is currently valued, currently appraised at $137,200. There's a map that shows you the location of uh, this lot. It is directly across the street. It, it is part of a two lots uh, parcel that's for sale. The other piece, which is uh, 118 um, South Street, it has the big white house that's on the corner and the several outbuildings um, on the property. The seller would like to sell both pieces of property together, but is willing to consider I'm, I'm told by the by the listing agent an offer to purchase uh, only the, the the vacant lot. Uh, as it was noted, it, it is located in a flood zone, which means that uh, there would be some restrictions on how it's uh, what kind of surface it could be used. But nevertheless, it could be used as a parking lot. Uh, I've also checked with the land use uh, office. Uh, it would not need to go to a full planning and zoning commission hearing. We, we would need to simply do a uh, an eight, what is it, uh, Marty, an 824 referral, I think is what it's called, to have them uh, uh, weigh in on it, but that probably would not be a problem. So I present that to my colleagues. Um, you know, we, we, we don't generally do a good job of seizing <coughs> opportunities like this, but I do think that this is something we should take a look at. Marty, did you have a comment? No, I just wanted to say 824, you were correct. Okay, yeah, I want to make sure I had that correct. Uh, so Richard Bryan, your thoughts? Yeah, I, I attended that uh, public hearing on the uh, proposed uh, upgrade of the park and was made aware earlier in that afternoon that that lot was for sale. And uh, the, one of the neighbors also brought it up. Uh, a lot of the neighbors did speak uh, about people parking all over on Elizabeth Street and South Street and uh, um, I can't think of the other street. So right parts on Grassy Plain. Yeah, and, and over to Grassy Plain. So it, it's a unique opportunity. The land doesn't become uh, available often for the town to, to um, seize like this. Uh, the opportunity, uh, I would be totally in support of it. Coming from my perspective, and I think I thought we're building lots than most people mm -hmm. in this room, the market's kind of spoken on the price on the lot. I don't disagree that we shouldn't try and buy the lot, but it is in a flood zone, which makes it incredibly difficult for any developer to purchase. So you know, at 137,000, I wouldn't be in favor of it. If we negotiated a lower price, then yeah, I think, I think it would make sense. But I mean, the lot's been listed for over a month. Mm -hmm. It hasn't sold. Uh, you know, most of the builders in town know it's in a flood zone, which is gonna scare most of them off just because yep. it's so difficult to build. So I think it would depend on the negotiated price. Okay. You know, what, what, what we negotiate in terms of the purchase price on the lot. 
um, for my support. It doesn't stop you guys from saying yeah. we're going to buy it and then I pray. I just, I think, it, I, I don't think the lot's worth 140000 Well, I, I think, Rich, correct me if I'm wrong. I, if I remember, it's been a while since we did something like this. Did we not at, at one time negotiate, uh, authorize the town attorney to contact the selling a, listing agent and negotiate a, a price? For this participant? No, no, or, just just in general. Well, yeah, yeah and, and well, I can tell you where it is. It was over on Wilshire Street, and we lost the lot twice over yeah. here. Well, yeah, there were some extenuating circumstances yeah, there. Yeah, but, you know, a lot of yes. flood zone. Yeah, no, I mean, it's, but it, it is, it's still a buildable lot, but, but it's it, been it's listed, going to cost it has been listed for over a month. Well, I know it has because I, mean, yeah. I look at every lot that comes up. Do you know what the listed price is? Because I, I want to say it was listed at 140000 it's listed, now, it's, now, listed, it's listed at 144.5 right now. Well, okay. Um, I, I th think we need to go into executive session with the town attorney and discuss. But uh, Marty, uh, is, is it possible to do an executive session without having it uh, pre-listed on the agenda? Yeah, it's possible as long as it's made clear that it's for the um, that it's for the purchase to discuss. Okay. You know, making an offer, I think you could do that. Okay. Uh, what I'd like to do then is hold this to the last item on our agenda, and then we'll we'll do that. We'll we'll have a short executive session to talk about this further. Okay, so I'll, I'll, we'll just delay this. We'll come back to it. Um, I'm going to move on then to item number nine, consideration of illicit discharge proposed ordinance. Um, we're going to table this because uh, the town attorney and our, our uh, town engineer are still working out the language. Marty, do you want to comment on that at all? This is yeah, I, I just wanted to, you know, last meeting you received a copy of the model ordinance that was done, I guess, by some people at UConn. And uh, James DeMeo there in your in your engineering department, I should say public works department, he was kind enough to send me uh, five or six different ordinances from different towns. And what I did was uh, the ones that I didn't think that were applicable to Bethel, I, did, I just skimmed them. Like, for instance, Hartford, I figured there's such a huge difference between Hartford and Bethel that it didn't make sense to look at that. But I, I looked at a couple. And uh, they seem to be much more understandable, straightforward, and just easier to deal with than the model one. So I talked to, to Mr. DeMeo today, and he had no problem with that. So what we're going to do is we're going to try to take a couple of the ones that seemed more akin to what Bethel should be like and try to combine them together to come up with something that's a lot easier to understand and if it's a lot easier to understand, it's going to be a lot easier to enforce and to get the people to move forward with it. So that, that's where we are. Okay. All right. So I'll entertain a motion at the table. So move. Second. All right. Those in favor? Aye. Aye. That carries. Thank you, Marty. Uh, so we're coming up to the, to the last two items uh, before we, well, last three items really, but before we talk about uh, South Street again. Consideration of uh, completing the police firing range project. Um, you have in your packet a memo from the Public Site Building Commission that on June 29th, they voted to ask the Board of Selectmen to approve an amount not to exceed $1.4 million to complete the training range at the Bethel Police Station. And this is the total amount, including the equipment, engineering costs, construction costs, plus a contingency, which uh, is probably a little bit larger than normal. So this is going to be a not to exceed price, but we want to make sure that this can be done and um, uh, don't have to go back to the voters again. And this would, uh, the plan is to pay for this out of fund balance. So this does not impact uh, tax rates at all, but we've been planning for this for some time. You have also in your packet, uh, Gerald Lynn Horoff's uh, and Nancy Ryan's and commissions latest uh, budget estimate. You'll see that this totals down to 1.4 million. Now here's the, here's the tough part. Um, in the Just past the first week of August is primary season. Starting in the first week of August, the machines need to be locked up. 
Um, so we either have to have a referendum before the end of July or else it's not going to happen until sometime late in the fall. And uh, thank you to the town attorney, uh, Marty Waller, who was able to negotiate with the supplier with Action Target. They are holding the price uh, that they had given us previously, the 820000 until August 1st. So the plan we have before us would call for us to hold a special town meeting on the 19th of July and adjourn it to or recess it to a machine vote, which would be set by the town meeting, but the target date for that is July 26th. And all of those things can happen. They're, they're all lined up. So um, we, we have all the material we need. We have uh, we are working with with some estimates in this, but again, um, the commission has worked with uh, with the with the contractors to provide estimates that are liberal enough and have a contingency built in that it's very unlikely that uh, these will uh, not only not exceed it, that it's very likely they'll be somewhat less than the 1.4 million. But to uh, to open this uh, discussion, I would put a motion on the floor that we approve an amount not to exceed $1.4 million for the completion of the police station training range, funds recommended to be taken from fund balance and forward to the Board of Finance for their uh, consideration. Second. Is there a second? Second. Okay, second by Brian. Any comments? Let's move it forward. We've talked about it for weeks. Forever. <laughs> Can I? Matt, can I ask a couple of questions? Certainly. I, I looked this over this afternoon, and um, um, I, I think though it shows here that we've got a uh, you've got a uh, a contingency, total project contingency of fifty four thousand dollars. You know, I got to tell you, unless this is some kind of new modern math, I get that it's more like two hundred thirty thousand. If you look originally, first first thing is. They're holding the price at $820,000. But yet, if you look on the sheet here, they've got down here an escalation of $160,000. What's that for? If they're holding the price for us at $820,000, why do we need to come up with another $160,000 escalation for that? Not only that, we also have a construction contingency of 9,200 and another escalation, I will assume for the construction through January 23rd, of $9,060. So when you add the 54, all of them together, it comes to $232,000. I mean, I, I like I said, if there wasn't, if they weren't holding the price at 820, I could understand the possibility of having the $160,000 escalation. But if they're holding at 820, I don't know why we need so much for that. Um, I mean, so, explain. so the, the amount is a not to exceed amount. And we did care. that. We did that for a number of reasons. We did not know if the um, if it would be possible for the board of selectmen to work with the registrars and town clerks to get a referendum before August first. So we wanted to have that escalation contingency in there just in case. And we also have um, a couple of other. So, so it, we've been warned both by public site and building commission members who are in the trades, especially in the HVAC and building maintenance trades about um, significant cost es escalation in mostly MEP, mechanical electrical plumbing. So since there's a smaller section um, that's not included in the action target part that has a little HVAC in it um, to condition the two rooms that are off of the range that that are kind of the control room and the other storage areas, et cetera, off the range. We need to work on, um, there is some planning being done to make sure that there's something in there to condition that air. And again, amount not to exceed, we were initially looking at a, a lower amount, uh, one point, kind of one and a half million, almost 1.2, yet hearing that, um, that some of our commission members working on um, purchasing HVAC equipment for a school system, et cetera, we're seeing cost escalations. You know, usually you see 
year over year, a 4% increase, they were seeing 15% increases in a couple of months. And if Geraldine has anything else she wants to throw in about our whole discussion um, about that, please do. Nancy, can we just you're, move you're, that, can Geraldine, we just you're, that to continue? No, you're muted, yep. I got it. Um, yeah, just to reiterate that when the Public Site and Building Commission set this budget, we were not clear, it was not certain that there would that there could be a referendum in time for the August 1st. So we included an escalation factor for the action target piece. Um, and then just the cost estimate that was done is um, it still has some possibility. The, the total, the scope of the project on the construction side still has some possibility of changing and evolving because the construction drawings are not completed. Uh, we haven't contracted with the vendor for the equipment, so the drawings haven't been um, coordinated between, uh, you know, locally the architects and engineers and the action target piece. So we wanted to be sure that we had enough contingency built in for those things um, that might change since we've had this cost estimate done. And on the escalation side, it um, we are not certain yet whether construction can start right away in the fall after the drawings are completed or whether the construction portion needs to wait until um, probably January or February. The action target piece itself has a five month lead time. So even if we can set, uh, um, send a purchase order over to action target right on August 1st, that equipment, the earliest that equipment would be available to install would be January. So on the local construction side, we need to build in some contingency to account for any, any cost increases between now and then. Um, I agree there are redundant contingencies and escalations in here, but at the time that the building committee acted on this budget in order to refer it to the Board of Selectmen, we wanted to be sure that all the bases were covered. Yes, Mar Marty, wouldn't it suffice if we just took that 160 and added it to contingency? I mean, we don't have to call it escalation. It's the same thing as far as I'm concerned. Yeah. I mean, well, it, it's just a different word that's being used. I mean, it, my, it, that's what it's for. If the price goes up, it's taken care of. I assume that's what they mean by escalation. Correct. My, my other question is, you guys are going to take this out to bid on the construction side, correct? But um, on the construction side, if that's what um, is required, then that's what we'll have to do. Yeah. Wouldn't we want to get bids from several contractors? Yeah. 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 Okay. So there, there wouldn't be any kind of consideration. So I know we had a whole discussion back in February, March about bid waiver for action target, which would have held the price. Um, no, I'm talking about construction, not action. I, I'm under, I'm under some, I understand. I'm kind of prefacing my question um, with, you know, our asking for a bid waiver back in February, March, and that was, that did not go through. So in looking at um, uh, the construction costs, would we do a bid waiver here too, to be able to get the costs together more quickly and, um, and put in place before you know, once the construction drawings are done, uh, before we see other crop cost increases, or are we going to have to put out an RFP and go out to bid? Gerald, okay. didn't you say at the meeting that uh, Action Target, even though they, they told uh, the town attorney they would uh, hold that price, there still might be a, uh, an escalation on the mechanical side of that work? No, we've, we've already worked there already. For the there, already was an, there already was an escalation in the mechanical side. There, the action target uh, cost is divided into two sort of two categories. One is the firing range equipment that they produce and fabricate. And the second part is the um, proprietary um, HVAC system to, uh, to, you know, to adequately ventilate the firing range in addition to heating and cooling conditioning the air. So in between the time that we received the initial pricing from um, the bidders on the equipment side uh, and, and to this point, um, the HVAC portion of the action target price has already escalated 15%. 
Action Target is holding their portion, uh, you know, the, what was referred to as Marty negotiating with Action Target. Action Target held the price on their their portion of it, the 455000 but we've already seen an escalation on the HVAC. So if we hit the August 1st date, there will be there would be no further escalation on either side. All right. So the three sixty four for the air for the uh, air HVA system includes that fifteen percent escalation already. Okay, Correct. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. All right. All right. Any any further questions? Okay, we have a motion on the floor to approve an amount not to exceed 1.4 million. Those in favor, signify by saying aye. Uh, aye. Aye. Any opposed? The motion carries. Next motion is uh, I'll put a motion on the floor that we establish a special town meeting to be held on July 19th, 2022 at 7 p.m. in meeting room A at the Clifford J. Hurge Municipal Center. Second. Okay, those in favor, signify by saying aye. Okay. I think that's a Tuesday. Is that one of our meetings? Uh, is that the 19th? Yes, it is. So yep. wouldn't we have to do a special meeting at 6 30 or we postpone our meeting? We can postpone our meeting. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll rearrange our meeting and see, we'll see what's on the agenda first. Okay. okay. Would you would you rather do the the town meeting at 6 30? Or is it I may be in Tennessee, so it may be a new point for me. Okay. <laughs> we'll leave it at seven o'clock. Good chance I won't be around, but I'm gonna be in Maryland. Whatever you guys want to do. Yeah, well, we'll 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 rearrange the board selected meeting for that day. So uh so anyway, was, was there a second to that? Yeah. Okay. Those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 That carries. Uh okay, last item before we go to the executive session. Uh Nancy and Gerald Lynn, thank you very much for joining us tonight. Appreciate it. Thank you. Um, I'm going to put a motion on the floor. You have a copy of the resolution in support of sustainable Bethel and sustainable CT. This is kind of some paperwork that's um, required to for sustainable CT to recognize the work of, uh, of our sustainability commission and make them eligible to apply for grant funding for some of the activities they do. So I'm going to put a, I'll make a motion that we approve the resolution in support of sustainable CT. Second. Okay. Those in favor? Aye. Aye. All right, that carries. Okay, so I will make a motion that we enter executive session at 8.38 p.m. inviting in uh, Mary Churchill and town attorney uh, Martin Lawler. Second. Second. Okay, those in favor? Aye. Aye, okay, let me, let me push up the door. We'll stop going through it. Yeah. Yep, yeah. pause the recording. So I'll make a we, so we entered executive session to discuss the possibility of the town purchasing the property at 134 South Street for use to expand parking uh, at the current Parloa Park. I want to make sure that that is noted that this is the, the park in its present condition um, because parking is inadequate. It has been for many years. Um, and I'm going to make a motion that we authorize the town attorney to uh, negotiate a purchase price, a potential purchase price with the owners. Second. Okay. Any further, any other discussion? Okay. Those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. That carries. And that concludes our agenda. So I'll entertain a motion to adjourn. Motion. Aye. Motion by Brian. Second by Rich. Those in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. Hey, Brian.